that were here about a year ago. Uh, my first anniversary at CVAC is in two weeks, uh, so I am very blessed that uh, you folks have allowed me to come back several times uh, since last August. Um, what I have to share today is um, I never thought I would ever have an opportunity to say what I'm about to say to a Seventh-day Adventist congregation. Um, but God has created the opportunity, and I pray that your hearts will receive what I believe God has given me to share uh, with this church. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for this, your holy Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the early church and the example that they set for this end-time church. I pray, Lord, that the minds and hearts of everyone within the sound of my voice will contemplate on the things that will be shared, not only uh, at this moment, but later on this afternoon, so that, Lord, that this church, again, can take on its role as the tip of the spear of revival in Connecticut in the Southern New England Conference and to bring back the power to the East that has been prophesied. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Amen. Everything in common. Um, I'm going to read um, from Acts 2, 42 to, the, to 47. And it reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And this, in conjunction with what we read in Acts 4, is a model or a formula for God's church, how God's church is to interact not only um, among themselves, but with the community at large. Uh, over the last year since I first was introduced to this church and other churches in Connecticut and Massachusetts, I've been saying the same thing every week, everywhere that I go, that Christ's method alone will give true success for reaching the people. Our Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He sympathized with them. He won their confidence, and then he bade them to follow him. These are simple instructions that for 115 years, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has ignored that we have not used Christ's method. We've decided to use other methods that come from other denominations that pervert what it is that God has called us to do. He's not called any other denomination or any faith to do what it is that we've been called to do. And so it's kind of like if I went to a mechanic and he's blowing bubbles or popping popcorn or selling uh, candy bars, but he's not He's not repairing any cars. You would say that that was a worthless mechanic. Amen? Oh, no. You would like that mechanic? You go to get your car fixed and he's just going to pop popcorn for you? Well, unfortunately, we've been popping popcorn. We've been selling candy bars. We've been doing a whole bunch of stuff. Did good things, but it's not what we were asked to do. It was not what we were commanded to do. Uh, I want to give you an example of this in uh, church history. Uh, in the 1890s, there was a gentleman from England by the name of George Mueller. And George Mueller was famous for his faith. That without asking anyone for funds, without soliciting, he would just pray to God. And he developed hundreds of, I mean, maybe not hundreds, but many orphanages that, that served thousands of children in England or throughout England. He was never in debt. And um, people were amazed at what his faith was able to accomplish. So it is, it is said that someone actually wrote a letter to Ellen White and saying, hey, we should do this. This is a good thing. George Mueller is doing this wonderful work in England. And we should also set up orphanages and help the poor children that their parents have abandoned them or have died. 
And she says, no, that's not what we've been called to do. We have a job, and Mr. Mueller is doing his job. It's a good thing to do, but we've not been called to establish what? Orphanages. And it's the same thing today, that we have been given a message. We've been given tools. We've been given a formula for how we are to operate as a church, as a movement, as God's remnant. And we have abdicated that responsibility over the years. Now, one of the reasons why I am focusing on the words, uh, everything in common, is that what I've noticed throughout my lifetime as a Seventh-day Adventist is that we don't, we, don't, we don't share. We don't have a lot of things in common. We are not really like the primitive church. How many churches were there in Jerusalem? Anyone can tell me? A city with over a million people, how many churches were there in Jerusalem? Anyone know? How many? I heard it. One. There was only one church. How many churches do we have in Metro um, Hartford? Over 16. Okay, that's fine. That's fine that we have 16 buildings uh, in Metro uh, Hartford. But are they operating as one body? Are they synchronizing their efforts? Are they sharing resources? Are they doing this? The answer is no. When we talk about having things in common, it means that we're sharing. It means that we are collaborating. It means that we're communicating effectively. The church that's described in the book of Acts had a common purpose. It had a common mission. It had common goals. It had a common objectives that everyone was aware of. And everyone put their time, their effort, their talent, their resources, their influence, and their power behind that one common purpose. And what was that common purpose? It was to represent Jesus by doing the very things that Jesus did while he was here on earth. Amen? It's a very quiet, the CVAC is normally a quiet church, but you guys, this is a morgue in this place today. But I'll, I'll take it for what it is. We have one purpose. And I'm going to read, uh, again, does, do, do, do the folks in this church believe in the spirit of prophecy? Okay. Uh, okay, just two people believe in the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Um, the rest of you bear with me then. Okay. The, the difference, and this is my opinion, based on 50 years of being a Seventh-day Adventist or being affiliated with this movement, is that the difference between our church today and for the last hundred years and the primitive church is that we have no sense of urgency, that everything can wait. While souls are perishing, we are still saying things can, we'll get to it, we'll do it soon enough, it'll get done. Matter of fact, I'm not going to do it, I'm going to let the pastor do it. I'm going to let somebody else do it. But what we're going to learn throughout this short presentation is that, I'm sorry, is that we each have a role. And our enemy, the Satan, has done a masterful job of convincing us that we can give that role a responsibility to love and to bless others with our gifts, with our talents, that we can give that to someone else, like the government. Why are there homeless people, but there are a million Adventists in, this, in, in North America division? There should be no homeless. Why? Because we should be doing something about it. Just like uh, in the primitive church. It says that there were Greek widows and Jewish widows, and the church took, took care of them. They didn't wait for Caesar to do it. Obamacare didn't do it. The church did it. And the church did it in a way that nobody lacked. This is where Adventism needs to go back. Everything in common, there needs to be a paradigm shift in Adventism. And I'm going to tell you that what I've seen in my own, with my own eyes in the last year is that this tsunami of revival, this paradigm shift in, in Adventism is happening right now. And that's the beautiful thing about a tsunami, is that when a tsunami uh, originates in the middle of the ocean, it's imperceptible. Nobody knows that it's there. But there is a tsunami taking place starting in Adventism right now and I will tell you I saw an example of it this week. I was invited to go to the pastor's retreat um, at Camp Winnipeg to speak to the ministers about this work, about collaboration, about unifying efforts, about 
uh, not operating as independent atoms or, si or in silos any longer. And when I first started this with my sons five years ago, people said, oh, no, Leslie, nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody's going to talk to you. The conference is corrupt. These guys, they're all in it for, wrong, for the wrong reasons. It's a power thing. Uh, that was a lie from the pit of hell. This is what I realized. Yes, if I were trying to do, do what I do in my own strength, it would be an impossibility. But when you do things in Jesus' name, all things are what? All things are possible. And so what we're seeing is a tectonic shift in the minds and the hearts of the ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I've been speaking to ministers since last April at my first workers' meeting. I was invited. And I've been to maybe about four or five of them. So these guys have seen me repeatedly over and over and over, saying pretty much the same thing, that pastors can't operate independently anymore. If there's 16 churches, then the eight pastors or the six pastors need to work together in order to develop one plan, one strategy, in order to reach the citizens or the residents of Hartford and Greater Hartford. Amen? Amen. Well, guess what? So this past week, this Tuesday, I'm there and I'm telling them what I have been telling them, that we have to break down these silos, not only between churches and between the conferences, but we also have to do it within the church. So for example, there's six departments in every church that their focus is in the community. They are outward facing, but yet they don't communicate with each other. They don't share uh, resources. They don't share funding. They do whatever they do in their own little space. That's not of God. It says that they had everything in common and this church flourished. The departments that I'm speaking about are youth, personal ministries, Sabbath school. Anybody know that Sabbath school is not for Seventh-day Adventists? Did you know that? That Sabbath school is an evangelistic tool. That when the lessons that you get are not so that you could come here and read those lessons verbatim and argue about what's in the lesson. That's not how the Sabbath school was established. Sabbath school lessons are there to give Adventist themes so that when the visitors that they bring to Sabbath school, we can discuss those themes. That's what Sabbath school, it's an evangelistic outreach. It's not just supposed to be a club for Seventh-day Adventists, but that's what it's become. And it was that way when I was a kid 50 years ago. It was like that when my mother was a kid 100 years ago. Okay? But how did it get like this? It gets like this when my people don't read. My people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. Where there is no vision, the people what? Perish. We are perishing. And we're causing others to perish because we have what they need. We have the solutions for every problem that this world faces. But yet we sit in this building once a week, and we think that we've done Jesus a favor. We will be found wanting in the judgment. We will be cursed in the judgment as Seventh-day Adventists. We have an undeniable and inalienable responsibility to engage the community like Jesus did. Not by having events. You've heard me say this before. We should be called Seventh-day Eventists. That's all we do is have events. But I've been trained and I've been taught that an event is has only two purposes. You have an event to let people know that you're doing something or you will be doing something over a period of time with certain outcomes or objectives associated with those actions or activities in the community. Then between that time and the next event you have, you're doing a whole bunch of stuff based on what you said you were gonna do. And the next event you have is to celebrate the fact that you actually accomplished what you said you were gonna do. But no, that's not how we do it. We'll have a health expo once a year. And there'll be very little going on in between as far as reaching the community, as far as engaging and educating the community about what we know as Seventh-day Adventists. Who are the longest living people in North America? Seventh-day Adventists. We know something that others are just figuring out. But you know what? They had to find out from the Buddhists they had to find out from others because we were so smug in the fact that we lived 10 years longer than everybody that we weren't sharing any of our gifts, our eight laws of health with anyone. Matter of fact, many of us aren't even using those eight laws. That's why we're dying like flies. There should be no illness in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We should be the healthiest people in, on the planet. 
Not just longest living, because just because you live long doesn't mean that your quality of life is what? Good. The bottom line is, is that we have it. You've heard uh, Pastor Tom talk about Saud Anwar. You've heard me talk about Saud Anwar. I was at a meeting last week with supporting ministries because I'm telling the people who run our restaurants, who run Seventh-day Adventist restaurants, uh, who run our juice bars, I'm telling them that they can't continue to operate without being a part of a team. That you can't just run your restaurant in Hadley, Massachusetts, and, and you're not communicating with the conference, or you're not communicating with other uh, Seventh-day Adventists. That is an error. That is wrong. So I'm there, and I show them the tape of Saud Anwar basically calling us out as do-nothings. Now, many of you probably saw that video. I'm sure Tom has showed that video. But he basically says that the Adventist church is like a, a, a very fast or expensive sports car that has all kinds of uh, power under its hood, but yet we're only driving at five miles an hour. When he, when he said that, that was like taking a rusty ice pick and putting it into my heart. You know why? Because he's right. And you know what he says? He said that if you would just do what you were created to do, that we would follow you. My faith would follow you. No amen in CVAC. Nobody's hearing me. That here we have a Muslim mayor. We have a guy that's a, a pulmonologist. He's a doctor. He's a smart guy. This guy's an expert on internal, I'm sorry, international affairs. This guy uh, uh, represents the World Health Organization at the United Nations. This guy speaks at Senate hearings uh, here in D.C. about health. And he's coming to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and saying, can you help me help my community become healthier? But yet, I guarantee you, in my afternoon program, there'll be 10 people there. See, because we have become so rich, we've become so comfortable in doing what we do, that we, you're not hearing what I'm saying, that there is no sense of urgency in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That God has called us out. We have been called out so that we could do something, so that we could do something for Him, which is to be identical to Him. Now, this paradigm shift, I want to just read something here. God's purpose for His church. Okay, I'm just going to read this verbatim. And this is taken from Acts of the Apostles. This is the first page of chapter 1. And the title is God's Purpose for His Church. And if you have not read this book, you should read this book. Because it tells how the early church was successful in doing what it did. And they were able to spread the gospel to the whole known world without a computer, without a car, without a jet, without a cell phone, without Facebook, without any of this stuff that we have, that we aren't even using to a fraction of its potential, but they were able to do it by going house to house. Why are we still here then? But I want to read you what the purpose of our church is. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan, and through His church shall be reflected to the world His fullness and His sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom He has called out of darkness into His marvelous light, are to show forth His glory. And how are we to show forth His glory? She goes on, The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Many and wonderful are the promises recorded in the scriptures recording regarding the church. This is God speaking about his church. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. I will make them and the places round my, about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in this season. And there will be showers of blessing. Saud Anwar quoted this in his last presentation. Um, back in May. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah about this church. Why does he know more about our purpose and our mission than we do? And if we know this is our purpose and our mission and we're not doing it, heaven help us. Ye are my witnesses. We are witnesses for Christ. 
Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, and I have saved, and I have showed them when there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses. Notice that when we put anything before God, then we have a strange God. Then he can't do what it is that he says that he would do for us individually and as a church. It goes on. <clears throat> I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand, and I will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out of prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Isaiah 43, 10 through, 10 through 12, and 42, 6 and 7. This is why we exist. We don't have any other purpose than this. Notice that it didn't say anything about keeping the Sabbath there, right? Notice that you keeping the Sabbath is not going to save you. Because Matthew 25, 31 through 37 tells me that when he comes in all his glory, he's going to ask us whether or not we did medical missionary work. He's going to ask us, when you saw me hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was cast out, you took me in. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. But Lord, when did we see you and hungered and fed you, naked and clothed you, cast out and took you in, sick in prison and visited you? Because you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you have also done it unto me. That's what you're going to be judged by. You're not going to be judged by how much tithe you returned, whether or not it was faithful or not. You're not going to be judged based on the offices that you held in the world or in the church. You are going to be judged based on whether or not you are a medical missionary, like Jesus was a medical missionary. All of us need to be trained in order to do this. You cannot put this off. Jesus never sent someone else to do what he was called to do. You can't send someone else to do what Jesus has called you to do specifically. And most Adventists don't know what they've been called to do. And I admit it, I was till six, seven years ago, I didn't know what I was doing as an Adventist. Adventism was totally irrelevant to me. I had stopped going to church for six years. I wouldn't go, I didn't want to hear any more singing. I didn't want to hear any more preaching. I didn't want to hear any more arguments. I didn't want to hear any more hate. I didn't want to hear any more out of my Adventist church. And I would go from church to church seeking nirvana, seeking peace, and there was no peace in any church that I went to. Why? Because when we are not doing what God has called us to do, then we have an opportunity to do what Satan wants us to do. Because at the end of the day, there's only, two, there's only two sides. And if you're not doing what God has called you to do, then you must be, doing, you must be working for the other side, knowingly or, unknown, or unknowingly. Okay? Now, I'm not here to beat up CVAC. I'm not here to beat anyone up. I'm here to urge you, urge you to take a real look at what you are doing sitting in this pew on a Sabbath day. And if you leave here today and continue to do what you've been doing for your whole life as an Adventist, heaven help you. Now, church life is supposed to be holistic. Now, why do I say that? Because notice that what these folks did. They went to the temple daily. They went from house to house breaking bread. Eating with people, that's, a, that's, a intimate, that's an intimate act. You don't eat with people you hate, right? I know I, I wouldn't try to take anything. If somebody says they hate me, I, well, what did you put in that food? You know, I might not want to eat that food, okay? But the bottom line is, is that notice that they were given a house-to-house -house ministry. Now, as an Adventist, this is unbelievable that you expect me to go door-to-door -door and do something with someone that I don't know. Yep, exactly. But you got to be trained to do it. And you have to know what the people need. Notice that when people would come to Jesus, what would Jesus say in most cases? Take me to your house. I heard them talk about Zacchaeus. Take me to your house. Jesus was a home visitor. When I used to teach, I used to do two to three hundred home visits a year. Why? Because when you're working in urban settings, that's a very difficult population. The poorer the people, the harder it is to educate their kids. The harder it is to get them to get involved, to advocate for their children's education. But after doing 200 home visits a year, I didn't have any problems getting my parents to come to school or having my parents help their kids with homework or having my parents do anything 
because they saw that I was willing to leave my comfort zone, like we need to leave the comfort zone of the four walls of this church, and I was willing to go into their homes and, and sit with their pit bulls lapping at my boots. Okay, very scary, very scary by the way. Okay, and I didn't mind that they had things crawling on their walls. It didn't matter to me because I love that child that was failing, that was two or three grade levels behind, and I know that we have this thing in America called the, called the school to prison pipeline. If you haven't heard of it, it's real. In poor communities, those kids are set up to fail. And when you fail, guess what? And you're 18 and you can't read, you still gotta buy your Jordans. And you're gonna figure out how to get that money to get those Jordans. Whether you sell drugs or steal, or you're gonna do something, but guess what? They've got a place for you. It's called a cemetery or prison, okay? And both of those, both of those uh, um, industries are doing very well right now, especially in poor communities. So, how is the church supposed to be holistic? Well, I know that a lot of our churches are commuter churches. You guys don't live in this neighborhood, but you know what? We make time for everything that's important to us. This is what I learned, even in, 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 in these communities. These parents would do whatever they had to do to get their kids the latest clothes because they didn't want their kids to be bullied because they didn't look like everybody else. We do what we want to do. We sacrifice for what we want to sacrifice. But God has said, come let us reason. Don't allow your feelings or your emotions or your comfort zone get you in trouble. He's asked us to do something. We are to be as obedient as children. When I ask my children to do something, at least in front of me, they always look like they do it. Okay? With God, we can't pretend. It's either we're doing it for real or we're faking it. And he knows if we're faking it. God is asking us to do something different as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, listen, I'm going to ask you a couple questions because I know that you guys are low energy today. <laughs> our, church, our church lacks community. Why are some of our members short-tempered, mean-spirited, alienated, and alone? Despite the position, the power in and out of the church, their wealth. Why do we have members that are just ornery? Why is that? Anybody know? Oh, you don't have any members like that here. I'm sorry? I didn't hear. Oh, devoid of the Holy Spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? Anyone know? Ask. Ask ask but then what do you do you continue thinking the way that you thought before do you keep acting the way that you thought before or that you acted before after you've asked him to come into you does that work no you're deluded oh let's see um lord i i want your spirit but i hate that guy sitting over there <laughs> that's oxymoronic oh matter of fact let me change that that's moronic okay it doesn't work like that when blind Bartimaeus came to Jesus, he says that I will that I receive my sight. You want to change, you have to will it. You have to ask God, then you have to will it. You have to bend your will to do that thing that you've asked him to help you to achieve. It's human and divine cooperation. It will not happen just because you prayed to God. That is a fallacy. That comes out of Catholicism. That comes out of paganism. Oh, I could kill, murder, rape, and pillage, but I bring a sacrifice to God and he will absolve me and I can go back the same day and rape, murder, kill and pillage. And I have God's favor. So when we say that we want to be who God has called us to be, but we're not bending our wills to change or even seeking to find out what it is that he's called us to be, then we have a problem. In my, in my afternoon program, I have some information that I want to share with you. I need you to come back. I want you to bend your wills to come back. Because again, you may, I, I, I do anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 miles a week on the road. Who knows, the enemy might have a 18-wheeler waiting for me to T-bone me someplace. You might never see me again. Hear what it is that I'm saying. Tomorrow is not promised. Don't, do, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Now, I want you to, I'm gonna ask you another question. Why is there so much strife in our churches? Wives hating wives, board members striving for supremacy and power by any means necessary. 
Why do we have this in our churches? Any questions? I'm sorry, any answers? This guy, is, he's trying to be the top of the class here. He's answering all the questions, okay? The bottom line is, is that we are unconverted. Plain and simple. It's not that we're not consecrating our time. No, we're unconverted. So we need to come to terms with why we are the way that we are. If your wife tells you that you're not a nice guy, you're probably not a nice guy, right? More than likely. They know you better than anybody else. I have one more question. Why do our Adventist youth abandon ship, abandon the faith, and launch into the deep of the world? Why do they leave? Say it again. Hypocrisy. Okay? Hypocrisy. But hypocrisy shouldn't be enough to cause them to leave. Because if they were rooted, they would see that hypocrisy for what it was, and they would rebuke that hypocrisy in the name of Jesus and keep it moving. Okay? But the bottom line is, is that there is something missing. We're not embedding a chip into our young people. And what we're not embedding into our young people is our identity. They don't know who we are and why we exist and why, we, why they come here on Saturday and their friends come go, go to church on They don't know that. They don't know specifically why Seventh-day Adventists exist. And they don't know what our purpose. So this becomes a meaningless venture every week, week in and week out. The bottom line is we have failed our young people. We need to come to terms with that and we need to turn that ship around and engage them and create authentic opportunities for them to participate in the leadership and in the running of this church. The bottom line is, is that guess what? They're gonna go someplace else where they are valued. They're gonna go someplace else where their opinions matter. They're gonna go someplace else where they can be leaders and the world has it all for them waiting. So what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to do what we've always done, expecting a different outcome? I've been told that that is insanity, that we can't expect a different outcome and we're doing the same things that our parents did. Our church lacks community. They had everything in common. The root word for community is common. They had everything together. They looked out for each other. They loved one another. They worried about each other. They made sure that no one lacked. We need to recalibrate. We need a makeover as Adventists. Because I know this, that we are the church militant and the church militant is not perfect. But the church militant is supposed to be in the process of, again, working with God's spirit to perfect its character by doing what God has called us to do. If we are not consciously working at perfecting our characters with the help of Jesus and what's the one way that we've been told that we can shape, that God can shape our characters? It's through medical missionary work. It's helping those that are less fortunate than us, that are suffering. Because when we are working with people or serving people that are in a worse state that we're in, then our problems aren't that big. Our problems aren't that bad. We'll stop whining about whatever it is that, I didn't get another raise this year. I'm only making six figures or whatever it is that you're whining about. At the end of the day, God has called us to a high and lofty purpose. I'm just gonna read two more quotes. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. The kingdom is to uplift and ennoble humanity. God's church is the court of holy life, filled with varied gifts and endowed with the Holy Spirit. The members are to find their happiness in the happiness of those whom they help and bless. I'm going to read that again because you're supposed to be finding, we're supposed to be finding, your children are supposed to be finding happiness in the happiness that we bring to others because we're helping them and blessing them. Woo! I think you guys are in coma state 15, okay? This is true worship. In Isaiah 58, true worship is helping those, feeding the hungry, breaking every yoke, letting the captives free. That's social justice. The bottom line is, is that God has given us a prescription for how we are to really worship him. He, 
I was going to say something. If we do all of this and we don't do uh, 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 Isaiah 58, um, 6 through 14, then coming here is useless to God. This is false worship. Okay? This is what he accuses Israel of in verses 1 through 6. Oh, you fast? You smite your, fist, your, your chest with the fist of wickedness? You do all these things, but I didn't ask you for that fast. I didn't ask you to fast for me. I asked you to help those that are less fortunate than you. That's what I asked you to do. That's the true fast. That's true worship. So if you think that coming to church is worship, you're wrong. If you think that returning your tithe and doing all the other rigmarole that we've been told is church, you're wrong. Church is organizing the members of this body, young and old, with other churches from both conferences to come up with solutions for the problems facing Hartford, for the problems facing South Windsor and Bloomfield and Meriden and every single city in this state. That's what true worship is. We are not worshiping until we do this. You can fool yourself. You can even raise your kids and fool them. But one day there's going to be what they call a comeuppance that you're going to have to answer. You can't say, if you're here today, you can't say you didn't hear it. If you, we're not, are we being live streamed someplace? If you're, if you're watching this from wherever it is that you're watching it, you can't say that you didn't know. Because God will not judge you without giving you the opportunity to choose obedience or disobedience. There's only two ways. And the Adventist Church has been endowed with a great and marvelous gift. But what I saw at this meeting, I saw pastors who are basically independent contractors coming together and saying, we want to do this as one body. I'm going to call up all the pastors in my area and I want to develop an evangelism zone, says Robert Sierra of Hudson, SDA, and, Stir and Sterling. Okay, now, I've been, this, this guy's heard me talk at least four or five times, but guess what? The Holy Spirit is moving. My job is to persevere and to persist and not give up. My job is to be like the widow and keep asking Seventh-day Adventists to do what Seventh-day Adventists have been called to do, that we've been ordained to do. There is a very unfortunate fact, though, that many of us will not heed this call. And I've quoted this before, taken from the book Messenger of the Lord by um, Herbert Douglas, page 538, where he talks about the shaking and that many a Seventh-day Adventist will leave this church when it comes time to do this work. Why? Because they will reject this message that I'm giving you today. You will reject, some of you will reject it. Ellen White as, uh, and her prophetic gifts, they will reject that. They will je reject the third angel's messages. I'm sorry, the third angel's message, the three angel's messages, total. This is what has been prophesied. If you're hearing me but not hearing me, you know, what I'm, you know what I mean. You're listening, but you're not really, it's not registering what I'm saying to you. That God is calling you out. Calling you out of your slumber. Calling you out of your sleep. To do a work that has never been done on this planet. That holy angels have not been given the authority to do. But have been commissioned to work as our assistants to get this work done. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Finding our happiness and the happiness of those whom we help and bless. This is, we've been given instructions for how we're supposed to do that. I'm going to read it verbatim. Every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to give Bible readings, how to conduct and teach Sabbath school classes, how best to help the poor, how to care for the sick, and how to work for the unconverted. That's your job. That's everybody's job. That's your kid's job your grandson's job. It's every Seventh-day Adventist job to do that. But we need to create what? This, this building needs to become a school for Christian workers. So that means that your board, your pastor, and everyone aff affiliated with leadership needs to consider what it is that I'm saying. It says, there should be schools of health, cooking schools, and classes in various lines of Christian health work. Why? There should not only be teaching, but actual work under experienced instructors. Let the teachers lead the way in working among the people and others uniting with them will learn from their example. One example is worth more than many precepts. Uh, this is a school. It is not set up as a school. 
There's not been a Seventh-day Adventist church that I've been in in 50 years that's been set up to do this. Is, is CVAC going to be the first one in southern New England to set itself up to teach other members, teach your youth to do the work that we've been called to do like Jesus? Is CVAC going to take on this responsibility? Now listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says. If you choose not to do this, this is what happens. If those to whom God has entrusted great talents of intellect put these gifts to a selfish use, they will be left after a period of trial to follow in their own way. God will take men who do not appear to be so richly endowed, who have not large uh, self-confidence, and he will make the weak strong because they trust in him to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. God will accept the wholehearted service and will himself make up the deficiencies. Okay? In everything that you see that I'm saying to you, I'm a very deficient person. But because I have chosen to give my will over to God, then he can use me. He can make me into something that I've never been. He has the same plan for you. Men deficient in school education, lowly in social position, have through the grace of Christ sometimes been wonderfully successful in winning souls for him. The secret of their success was their confidence in God. You have no excuse. If you say, oh, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, then you lie on God. You're calling God a liar. They learn daily of him who is wonderful in counsel and mighty in power. I am blessed to be in the position that I'm in. God is opening opportunities for me to realize the fact that I was a part of a dead church. I was a, dead, a part of a dead movement. This movement is coming awake, not because of me. Not because of me. It's in spite of me. But God needs others to wake up needs our young people to step up and do this work and learn so that they themselves can be a part of this. Church members must work. They must educate themselves, striving to reach the highest standards set before them. This the Lord will help them to reach if they cooperate with him. We should not let slip even one opportunity of qualifying ourselves intellectually for, to work for God. The divine standard the Lord desires to obtain all education possible with the object in view of imparting our knowledge to others. I'm here to teach you. Go teach, make disciples. But you can't teach someone something that you have not learned for yourself. If you just take my word for it, that's topical knowledge. That's topical. They're going to ask you something that you're not going to be able to answer. But if you study to show thyself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, God will bless you. The purpose of my presentation today is to take away every excuse for inactivity as a Seventh-day Adventist. To take away every lame excuse for why you are not stepping your game up, why you are not uh, learning and striving to educate yourself about what you, what we have been called to do on this planet, in this city, in the city that you live, within the footprint of this evangelism zone. God is not to be mocked. You've heard this time and time again. What are you going to do with it? The greatest help that can be given our people is to teach them to work for God and to depend on Him, not on the ministers. Let them learn to work as Christ's work. Those who have had the spiritual oversight of the church should devise ways and means by which an opportunity may be given to every member of the church to act in some part in, the, in God's work. The church has failed you. The Seventh-day Adventist leadership has failed you. But today is a new day. David Dennis, John Omoa, Tom Dombrowski, Michael Henry, uh, and 40 other ministers are saying that this is the way. They're going to walk in this. The last group that is not in the formula yet are members. Because what? Councils for the Church, page 58, paragraph 1. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until men and women comprising the church membership rally to the work. Are you rallying to the work? Is this church rallying to the work? Have you signed up for chat training? Have you decided that you're going to take the next step to level your knowledge so that you could be a part of a movement? It says, until men and women comprising the church rally to the work and unite their efforts with ministers and church officers. The, the, the ministers and church officers have already united the only missing piece are you, 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 and you. 
You have to make up your mind. Choose this day whom you will serve. This is a call to action. This is an appeal for you to leave your comfort zone as a Seventh-day Adventist. And like I, like I often say, many of us are Seventh-day Adventists like me in name only. There's 66 other faiths, Protestants, that go to church on the seventh day. That does not make them a Seventh-day Adventist. But coming to a Seventh-day Adventist church and calling yourself a Seventh-day Adventist when you're not doing what Seventh-day Adventists were created to do does not make you a Seventh-day Adventist. So I challenge everyone in this room, are you really a Seventh-day Adventist? Or are you what we refer to as a nominal Seventh-day Adventist in name only? By their fruits, you will know them. You can tell me anything that you want to. But if you're going to go home and cozy up in your very luxuriant king-size bed and take a long nap this afternoon, then you ain't serious. God is calling you to action today, not tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. Last quote. There should be a well-organized plan for the employment of workers to go into all our churches, large and small, to instruct the members how to labor for the upbuilding of the church and also for unbelievers. That which is needed now for the upbuilding of our church is the nice work of wise laborers to discern and develop talent in the church. Talent that can be educated for the master's service. Those who will labor in visiting the churches should give the brethren and sisters instruction in practical methods of doing missionary work. Let there be a class for the training of the youth as well. Young men and women should be educated to become workers at home, in their neighborhoods, and in the church. Councils for the Church, page 69. I leave you on that note that God has called this church to a great and lofty outcome. That we are more than conquerors. I already see a crown on my head. I'm envisioning it. I'm already envisioning this mansion that he went to prepare for me. I'm envisioning the seven days from earth to heaven. I'm envisioning everything that has been given to us in the Bible for what we should look forward to if we are obedient to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am praying and will continue to pray for CVAC, for you individually and as, a, and as a church body, that you will come out of the slumber that we've all been in. The Bible is very clear that how many of the, how many of the uh, virgins were sleeping? How many? All 10 were sleeping. So it's okay that you were asleep, but now you're getting a wake-up call. It's time to wake up. And on that note, I just want to thank you all for responding to this call to action. We will be here at 3 o'clock, and I will be showing and teaching this church exactly what the next steps are. How do you actually take what you've heard and put it into action? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for your holy Sabbath day. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to speak to your people, to speak truth to your people, and to beseech your people to leave the comfort zone of Adventism, to become radical Adventists, not in the sense of political radicalism, but doing the work of Christ with reckless abandon, doing it with no thought of self, doing it because you've asked us to do it in a specific way. Again, Lord, you know the hearts and the minds of every person here. You know the struggles that, that they're experiencing even right now. I pray, Lord, that you will send your spirit to protect their minds from the attacks of the enemy who is doing all in his power to distract every person here from hearing and answering this call. Again, Lord, we love you. We know you love us even more than we love you. And I just thank you again, Lord, for doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus that makes um, our redemption possible. And we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for all that this church, all that these members will do for the surrounding community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.